So these are more or less straight lines here. We discovered that the change in global mean temperatures or delta global mean temperature between the year T1 and the year T2, so, is proportional just to this integral, and the integral is simply the cumulative emissions over that period of time. Now, I repeat it for you, but for an engineer, that's easy. So it's just the integral over the emissions profile, if you like. So you just sum up every year the amount of CO2 that has been emitted. And if you know that total amount, you can tell what the global mean temperature change will be after the end of that period. And it doesn't matter whether you spend the CO2, all of it in the beginning or towards the end, or you spread it out evenly. It's just the integral that matters. Now, here comes an interesting point, because despite all the complexities of climate science, where you have chaos and all things, phase transitions and so on, you can deal with a simple formula. And that means we can calculate if the nations of the world said, in Copenhagen, Mr. Obama said, two degrees is the limit. I can calculate, if this is two degrees, you can calculate how much carbon budget we have left for the world. I can calculate what is the upper limit of the cumulative emissions. And I can tell you what it is. It is with a probability like a coin, you know, 50% probability, <coughs> it is 750 billion tons of CO2, which humanity can still spend in order to stay within the two degrees limit. This is a practical exercise of political decision making based on good science, really. Yeah? So that's, now this is a very inconvenient truth because it simply says, if we want to stay below two degrees warming, which is now more or less an agreement between 194 countries, we have just a finite carbon credit with the climate system. And it's 750 billion tons. And we have to decide how to spend it in the future. Do we want to spend everything now or later on? And this is how you could spend it, because the area under the curve, the integral, is always with 750 gigatons or gigatons here. But you see, an integral is a very nasty mathematical entity. Because if the curve is always like that, but the area is the same. Now, let's assume this is the global profile of emissions. So today it's about 35, even more, yeah, it's a, around 35 billion tons of CO2 emitted from all types of sources. If we would peak the emissions, if we would have peaked last year, then we could spend our carbon credit with nature in this way, for example. So it would have to fall. But even in the middle of the century, we, would still, we could still spend a little bit of carbon. If we wait for four more years, 2015, we would have to go along the blue line, and we would run out of carbon credit already in 2045. But if, and that's the most realistic thing of all, if we would peak global emissions in 2020, you have to follow the red line. So the overshooting here has to be chipped away in the later stage of the development. And that means phasing out carbon completely by the year 2040 at the global scale. And that is quite a challenge, yeah? I mean, I'm just telling you because to just show you what the political rationale is. If you say two degrees is the limit for global warming, and that has been decided, so to speak, under the framework convention, when physics tells you that you have a final, finite carbon budget, it's about 750 gigatons, and if you cannot bend the curve before the year 2020, you have to follow a decarbonization line later on, like the red line here. And that means it has a reduction rate of CO2 per year of 9%. 
And this is something you can only achieve in war times, for example. So the first lesson to be learned is try to peak before 2020, of course. Or you could say, if that cannot be achieved, something really transformational has to happen afterwards. And transformational means that we have to have a new industrial revolution, clearly. Yeah? So I'll leave you with that because, OK. I had many stimulating discussions today, starting with your president here. Uh, I really enjoyed our conversation and later on with students and so on. <coughs> you see, engineering is key to innovation, clearly. Whether you are a civil engineer, mechanical engineer, uh, communications engineer, what have you, uh, electrical engineering. But it all has to be part of the human enterprise, if you like. If you want to change the world, how our existing system runs and operates, you need to see that your technical solutions are being absorbed by society. Otherwise, it, it won't work. Yeah? You can invent the most miraculous thing, but it will fall completely flat. Or the other way around. You know, when the personal computers were invented in the 1970s, I think, late 1960s, <coughs> based on the John von Neumann architecture, actually, when the CEO of IBM said, when he was asked how many of his personal computers, PCs, do you expect to sell in the world, he said, maybe a dozen. That's a famous uh, sort of misprojection of technological innovation. Eh? But it can also be the other way around. Eh? You expect to sell a billion semiconductor devices over the next decade, but nobody will buy it because the technological frontier has moved on. So it's very tricky, actually, to do that. But what you need in the end in order to have a transformation is you need what we call the social contract. You need to understand <coughs> the social dimensions of innovation. How a market, how a society, how an international regime is absorbing innovation. Eh? That's extremely important. And in order to do that, you have to have a dialogue with society. Eh? So I would, I'm not here to give you any advice, but within our own technical innovation community in Germany, for example, in the United States and UK, we think that the social dimensions of innovation are extremely important. In order to do that, you have to lead a really vivid, a really intense, a really broad dialogue with society, what type of innovation they are wanting, and what type of innovation they are willing to accept. That's very important. Because if you want to base your economy in the future, say, on renewable energy, you have to overhaul the entire infrastructure we have. Eh? You have to build completely new transmission lines and so on. It has to be accepted by people. Eh? And so the social dimension of innovation are all important. Eh? So don't forget about the humanities whenever you think about technology. Yeah? I think that's a message that cannot be repeated often enough. So I conclude now. Because we debated all that in Stockholm, you see the crown princess. Oh, sorry for that. Uh, OK, I have to go back. OK, here, here we go. The crown princess Victoria, she's and when we had the so-called Stockholm me Memorandum, I'll give you just two quotes here. You can look it up on the website of the Global Sustainability Symposium. And the first one is, we cannot afford the luxury of denial anymore, so we must respond, respond rationally, equipped with scientific evidence. But was the global warming challenge? How can we avoid six or eight degrees warming? And also, we are the first generation facing the evidence of global change. And here we go. We are standing here at the moment in history when a great transformation is needed. 
So, my prediction is, and you know, predictions are always complicated when they relate to the future. Most people are very good in predicting the past, but uh, you have to run the risk. So, let's call it a projection. I guess we are now at this, at this situation in history, and everybody's part of that. Whether you are an oil producing country, whether you are having a lot of coal, whether you're going into the renewables, whether you have problems with your soil and food production, we are in the midst of a transformation which will change the world more than it was changed by humankind over the last thousand years. It will be at least of the caliber of the Industrial Revolution. But the Industrial Revolution, to come back to that again, was done actually spearheaded in a tiny little part of England eh, where some factors came together. Now today, over the next decade, it will be a global transformation. Eh? It will be an industrial revolution, but it will be of planetary scale. Eh? And I think being part of that, spearheading it even, working at the frontiers of innovation is the best place to be, and that will guarantee to be ahead of the pack and to be a successful knowledge enterprise. And that's, by the way, something I expect Khalifa University to be. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for a very provocative um, and interesting um, talk. Uh, I will, as people are sort of trying to get their thinking together and ask questions, maybe I will ask the first one. Uh, first of all, I want to say the sort of reminding of something you said before, that the future is not what it used to be, uh, certainly <laughs> from the stock. Um, you, you suggest different solution, but yet, and then disparage the, the one that could have been drawn mm. from the Manhattan Project. Yeah. Even if we were to reduce to the famous two degree tipping point, let's assume we were successful, it, mm. it still might not be enough. Mm. Um, and so prevent, prevention policy might at the end fail. So isn't that, shouldn't we see that people are not as reasonable as we would like them to be, that uh, although they know they shouldn't smoke, they still smoke, or, and we know that they, they shouldn't be drinking or too much water, waste water, and they still waste water. Mm. And if that's the truth, let me just take a different mm. advocate position here. Uh, shouldn't we be considering the surgical uh, solutions that you were not ready okay. to consider and sort of, yes, what yeah. about managing uh, the solar radiation? Uh, what about sending missiles to deploy metal yeah. flakes in the atmosphere that would cool the earth? Uh, if nothing would work, why not that mm. option? Mm. What's, mm. Can you comment on that? Yeah, no, I mean, it is, this is not a Certainly not a trivial question, and everybody who is involved in that field is uh, in a moral dilemma, if you like. So, my good friend, uh, Paul Crutzen, who is the Nobel laureate in chemistry, and together with Sherry Rowland and Mario Molina, discovered the mechanisms behind the destruction of the ozone layer in the stratosphere, so world-famous colleague. He actually said, yes, as a last exit, a desperate last move, we should do it. Uh, the problem is the following. First of all, I showed you, or I mentioned the ocean acidification problem, yeah, you know, turning still water into the sparkling water. That is going to happen. Uh, and solar radiation management doesn't help in this respect. Uh, the oceans will still go acidic. So you really have to remove the CO2. The other thing is that's why I called it, I re reminded you of the, the arms race. Now, just imagine the world is not able to agree on a global treaty on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Now, just think of what might happen if one country would decide, say India, in the year 2050, we feel that the Indian summer monsoon is being destabilized by global warming. That is 
a fairly likely thing that is, by the way, chaos science at its best. Uh, we can even show that the monsoon dynamics can be mapped onto a strange attractor, uh, just for the specialists here, which is a completely chaotic dynamics. Uh, if we would feel we have, I mean, I talked to the Indian Minister for Environment and also for Agriculture. If the summer monsoon would fail in India, it would be the end of the Indian economy, yeah? because still 40%, I think, of the people work in the agriculture. And so, so it would be a complete disaster. Okay, so let's assume India would decide, because it wouldn't find support all over the world for that, just to send rockets to the stratosphere. Now, the Russians may not like this, because they say, oh, we would love a little bit of global warming, eh? when we can use our fertile soils. In the, in the north, actually, I had a chance about 10 years ago to talk to President Putin about that. Eh? And he said, we expect we are welcoming global warming. It will make our country much richer in the end. Eh? And uh, it's, it's very good that we have we will overcome internal winter. So the Russians will decide to shoot down the Indian missiles. Eh? Now, India, uh, now China will interfere because we cannot accept this on the Asian continent, eh? but uh, the Russians sort of control and they also have problems with the rising sea level, more stronger tropical cyclones and so on. Eh? So you can just imagine, and if a country like North Korea might interfere, or others eh, who act very irrational. Uh, I mean, can you really figure out that the world as a whole would decide on who is going to turn the knobs, pushing the buttons and so on? Uh, it's, it's, it's almost a nightmare from a geopolitical point of view. Uh, so the cure would be worse than, than the sickness, really. Uh, so we should avoid just everything to do it. I'm going to take uh, questions, the gentleman here in the blue. Okay, I'm just, mm -hmm. we'll start writing them down. The yes, now. Ivan. Can you please bring the microphone? Oh, yeah, that's good. Thank you very much indeed. It's very illuminating and fascinating, really, to uh, see and hear from you such an expertise uh, opinion, really. My uh, point is that uh, when I read the recent innovative policy for climate change, a report for the, to the nation <coughs> uh, set by the United States, you mentioned basically that the U.S. is not spending on R&D. Mm. Uh, it's spending about 60 billion while it's spending on armaments probably at 400 billion or 600. Mm. I know the recent budget will be lesser than uh, the, new, the new budget is less than the, the, the old one. My question is, that my point is like this. I mean, uh, we are spending on security, as you showed us, this too, too much. Mm -hmm. And we don't spend on this new technology, these new technologies of the future uh, as much as we like to do. Mm -hmm. So how can we really bridge this gap while we don't have the funds? The human resources for these kind of projects are not really many people who are working at the moment mm. in capturing uh, carbons and doing all these kind of things, uh, storages of uh, the sea. Uh, very few uh, people, very few people actually working in this, not many even institutions. Uh, no strategic outlooks whatsoever from the uh, stakeholders neither China or America or Britain. Or, you mentioned uh, quite uh, uh, rightly uh, the Durban uh, and the other uh, conferences, we still need more commitments. Political will is that there. Mm. So how can we encourage ourselves to have mm. this raising prospect to, mm. uh, you know, to have this morale out, outlifting in our soul, mm. uh, in our soul to, uh, to expect the, the positive rather than the negative? Thank mm. you. Yeah, thank mm. you. I mean, uh, in the United States, uh, so, for example, the, the chief advisor to President Obama is, uh, is, is a very good friend of mine, John Holbrun, yeah, coming from Harvard. And Steve Chu is a Nobel laureate in physics, is now the energy minister. And these people really try to, to move forward, yeah, clearly. And when it turned out that the Congress turned down many proposals in the end. And it has to do simply with the polarity you have in the current United States policy, yeah, Republicans against Democrats and so on. I mean, 
you are an American citizen and there are others here that can explain that better, but I recall that I was in the United States and I listened to a radio coverage of people, a reporter was in the streets of Manhattan and asking people about global warming. And he said, ask a lady, do you believe in global warming? And she said, no. And uh, when he asked her, so why are you so, uh, so, so, so absolute about that? And he said, because I'm a member of the Republican Party. Yeah? <laughs> so, oh, okay. So that's why I talked about scientific evidence. Yeah? The scientific evidence has nothing to do with parties. This is unfortunately a situation. I'm sure that the United States will overcome that. Yeah? So maybe in a few years from now, one will start to tackle and go fully into the innovation thing. But in the end, I guess, the most important thing, and that is also the other part of, uh, of an industrial revolution, you have to have positive examples. Well, you have to have role models. Now, Germany has now embarked on that transformation. The politics was really bad, but the outcome, I think, is a good one. Now, Germany is the first biggest economy in the world. It's the second biggest exporting nation in the world, and it's the third biggest country regarding scientific output. Yeah? So it's not the biggest one, but it's relevant. Yeah? And it's the leading economy in Europe. Yeah? So if that experiment would work, uh, it would demonstrate that other countries might need to follow, uh, simply for comparative economic advantage. And the same is true to some extent in China. I mean, China is now, with the current five years plan, pursuing all types of developments. Yeah? So we do a lot of nuclear, we do renewables, we do even coal to liquid, uh, we do just about everything. But knowing the Chinese pretty well, you can be absolutely sure that after the end of this five years plan, we will precisely know what are the horses we want to bet on in the future. And if they decide to bet more or less on the renewable path, I mean, it will change the world, really. Yeah? It will change the industrial world. So if you have a number of examples, and I mentioned this also this morning in the discussion, uh, when you study, and I think that's a very important thing, yeah? if you do technological innovation, I, I just advise you to study also the history of technology. That tells you amazing stories, really. Yeah? It's not just the Industrial Revolution, uh, how the IT revolution came about, and so on. And, you know, you often find that you have two competing systems. An old system, let's say the fossil system, which has served us all well. I mean, the evolution of humankind would have been impossible without using uh, coal and gas and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and oil. But it's the old system which was more or less created in the 1950s. Now you have an, a new system which is more or less a renewable and efficient one, uh, sort of competing with it. Now, the new system in general takes over if it pervades the entire system to an extent of about 15%. Well, that's the interesting thing. Then the system completely tips into the new mode of operation. So uh, the practical answer to your question would be, if you just find 15% of global capacity, say Germany, China, and a few others, to go into the new mode, then the global system will be tipped into the new mode of operation. Eh? Now, don't take this as a prediction because to prove such a law is very difficult, of course. Eh? But it's not true that you have to change the entire system before it sort of locks into the new mode of operation. You just have to, and that's the theory of phase transitions, eh? you have to just change a small but significant part of the system. So that was a long-winded answer, of course, eh? but it's one of my pet subjects. The gentleman just uh, with the white shirt. And if you are interested, because I will pick only a few questions before the reception, so just raise your hand so I can see it. Oh, the yeah. Gentleman. I can take more. <laughs> I can take more. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much.
much a very stimulating uh, lecture. Um, you have shown that we have a certain amount of carbon left, a budget left, to keep it under the two degrees. But if one factors in the uh, super exponential uh, population growth of the Earth, doesn't that mean that we have to reduce our own personal carbon footprint like yesterday mm -hmm. in order to still achieve that? Yeah, which is difficult for physical reasons. Uh, uh, but uh, maybe through black hole engineering we could do that going back in time. That was a joke, of course. Uh, but um, um, the good news is that due to many developments and uh, the most important thing about Sen is always insisting on that is the education of women is the best way to stabilize the population on this globe. Uh? So that's the all important factor, definitely. Yeah. And uh, I mean, I was amazed to see here in the engineering school or in Khalifa University that uh, I think the percentage of women is 80% in the engineering or something like that. Uh. 50. But anyway, it's much, much higher than what in you in would... In the classroom, he was... In a classroom, at least. <laughs> okay, but anyway. So the good news is not only that this tremendous potential of, of rain power will be tapped, uh, but it also will have an impact on the overall stabilization of global population. Still, we calculate this always with, I think, a stabilization at about 9 billion people. Uh, it may be 300 million more or less, but we still can calculate this, and then it's true, we could break it down to personal carbon budgets. That is an idea that has been raised very often. So you would not give a carbon budget to an entire country, but you would give it to every person on this planet. And then more or less, it's about two tons per year over the next 50 years. Two tons. Now, I calculated that means you could fl drive a Mercedes for 20,000 kilometers for the two tons, but then you couldn't do anything else. No air conditioning, no heating and so on, or you could fly from here to New York and back, and that's it. Eh? So we have to be a little bit more clever in this. Uh, but if you really calculate it uh, based on higher energy efficiency 